don't know why the other speakers haven't used it, but this is up here and it's free. So <laughs> I'm, uh, we drink from the bottle, but I'm from Paul and we're classy. So I've got a paper cup that I'll be using for this. Um, so thanks for coming. Um, the title is a little bit of a uh, clickbaity type thing because I've been asked by a lot of people what does this actually mean so I will be running through exactly what it means and also um, I haven't quite timed the talk so I might speed up or slow down or yeah miss things so firstly me um, I work with HealthQ Technologies I've got the title DevOps Team Lead and as Will said that's a misnomer but we uh, won't go into that now uh, I also started the Cape Town DevOps Meetup Group in 2015 um, and then suckered three other people in to help me organize it. Uh, one of them actually then had a chat with one of the other DevOps days organizer, Bridget Cromhout, last year at ScaleConf, and then we organized our first one in November last year, which was yeah, fun. Um, and then the last one is I live in Rondebosch, and yes, that is my roof, um, and no, it's not updated on Google Maps yet. I've been checking for a year. It's not there yet. <laughs> cool. Um, so on to the, what I do during the day. I work for a company called HealthQ. Um, there's also the other side of the business which is called LifeQ and I don't, don't want to try and define what the differences are because I'm not quite sure. But basically we do this. This is not uh, SaaS, which is Steps as a Service. This is actually our devices that we use for things. Um, the bottom two are commercial Garmin devices that we have our own firmware on and then this is an internal device de um, designed and used by us for validation and testing things. Um, so basically we are in the healthcare slash insurance space where we build single processing models on the devices um, and then take those, uh, that data coming out, process it further um, into things like sleep and stress and um, st um, not, well, steps taken as well and a couple of other metrics. Um, and just to put things in perspective, I'm not quite sure if I'm allowed to put this, but uh, Yaku has not forbid me completely and the MD hasn't said yes or no. So we did a pilot recently. Um, I'm not going to tell you how many people, um, but this is some of the stats for that pilot in terms of the data volumes that went through our system. Um, so quite a bit of raw data, a lot of individual files and things. Um, and we managed to not really be too, down too much during that time period, which was quite nice. So now onto the title explanation. Greenfields. Everybody knows what a greenfield project is. You have this lovely field and you can build whatever you want on it. Um, there's nothing stopping you from doing things or any reason why you can't really do things um, and everybody is happy. Then when I started looking for a definition of the Brownfield project, the EPA of all people actually had a very nice definition, which is this one. Um, basically it comes down to there are things that prevent you from doing things the way you want to do them. So a Brownfield project would look something more like this. What you, what you can see there in the background, the biggest thing is that's your, your monolith. That's the thing that's been making the business some money. Um, it's, you know, reliable, happy. It's doing the job. Everybody you know, knows it's ugly, but it works. Next to it, that little bit of heightened rubble is that's where the foundations were um, uh, made for the version 2, which still hasn't happened um, because there's just not enough money and for any warrant to actually do that. And then if you look closely on the left-hand side, you see that power line over there. That's actually a direct link from a different application into yours, which means you can't move that power line. So you can't build something new there either. Um, so that's kind of the definition of a brownfield project. It's a legacy project that's been around for a while. There are things that you really want to change and you shudder at, but it's there for a reason and it's working. So the cost of actually changing it is higher than the reward to change it at that point. Um, next up, to explain a little... DevOps problem, so a lot of people don't quite understand the DevOps definition and I'm not going to go into it, um, but this seems to be a fairly standard um, idea of <laughs> what DevOps does. Um, so basically you have the developers writing a lot of features and they take the code and they throw it at the DevOps engineer and say, hey, put it on the server, make it run, which is traditionally ops position, but everybody nowadays seems to think that DevOps is a new word for that and that solves all the problems, so there you go. Where it's actually a lot more than that. I um, actually forgot about on my first slide because I didn't have notes or I didn't read them. Um, that, so there was a lot of DevOps on that first one about what I do. I can add to that. We own um, the DevOps of Cape Town domain and we even have a PTY registered called DevOps Cape Town. And the fun thing with that is everybody seems to think I know what DevOps is. 
um, which is why I grow the beard, because that convinces them, but <laughs> yeah. So getting on to the actual second part of the project title. So I prefer actually, greenfields are nice, but normally I like solving problems and challenges. So I like the brownfield projects, digging, scratching, figuring things out, making them better. Um, Yaku was very surprised when I told him when I joined um, Healthcare that I actually want to be in charge of production and stuff. I want that responsibility because that's where the fun is. If it doesn't break and you don't learn, then it's like a tree falling in the forest and yeah. So DevOps. Everybody's seen these ads or type of ads plastered next to bridges um, and somewhere in town. Um, it promises various things um, that it'll solve, including removing witchcraft. And who here would actually use this ad and believe it? Okay. One. No. <laughs> okay. Now, why do people believe this then? <laughs> DevOps is the new Agile, is the new Scrum. It's uh, if you get a little bit of DevOps and you rub it on your project, then you know it'll make the project successful. So that's kind of like the summary and the, the, the description of what the talk is going to be about. I'm going to go through a couple of practical steps um, that you can use um, to figure out, uh, to, to improve your system at, um, at the place you're currently working. Because most systems have got a couple of small things that you can fairly easily fix, but it's normally, we don't think about those points at first because that bigger fish to fry, get a new feature out, get something else out, and then you don't spend time actually making things quicker and then in the long run win the time. So the talk is mainly going to be focused on what we do with ABIT WS because we run everything in Amazon Web Services. Um, I have used uh, Azure before. It was unfortunately for them not a great time because they were in the process of switching between the one portal and the other portal. So half the stuff was on the one side, the other half on the other stuff, uh, other side. It was a bit of a mixed bag. So it's not that I dislike um, Azure or Google Cloud. It's just on the Azure front, uh, I had very little experience with it. And on the Google Cloud, I know it's there, but I have not yet used it. Um, and given the complexity of all of these platforms, I don't think you can easily say that you are an expert on all three of them, or even two on them. Um, so when we started our um, Amazon um, journey, we had one account. And the reason for that was just the devs had built some services, and we um, had some console access, and everybody was admin, and they added things, and they worked, which is great for a startup. Uh, because you actually are more interested in getting features going than just getting um, you know, everything polished like Mike referenced earlier. Uh, so then I came along in middle of 2015 somewhere and I started doing some freelancing for them um, and I started automating things. The, the main idea was there to just make sure that when we go to staging and finally production, we will have a nice automated system and we'd know how to make changes. Because if you've got, let's say, 10 different devs with console access clicking and changing things, unless everybody has got a very, very good logbook, you have no idea what is set up there. Um, and there's still some interesting things over there. And normally, people at talks won't tell you that all the gremlins in the system. But we still have one or two systems on devs with S3 full access, which they work. But when you go to staging, then things break. And you kind of like wonder why. Um, I'm also going to poke a little bit of fun here and there about Amazon. Um, it's not because I don't like you, I really like you guys, but there are some services that do need a little bit of attention and changes and just some nice small things that'll make life easier. Um, one example would be if you can make an auto scaling group, talk to Route 53, to just as it increases the node, just add them to that round robin DNS, that would be great because current solution is set up a Lambda function, listening to events from the auto scaling group, permissions, I am, all of that, which just seems very, very complex, or I don't understand. So first thing I did when I came to HealthQ is I learned about Amazon's cross-account um, permission delegation, and that sounded great. So I thought, OK, cool, we've got one account. Um, what's greater than one? Um, seven. So the reason for that is that we have got one master account, which contains all our users, um, as in human users, interacting with the system. And then we've got two billing accounts. That is uh, for the two different um, entities we deal with. Uh, they pay the bill for different environments. Then from those two, each one of them have got two actual environments, so dev testing, staging, and production. Um, production is not quite up yet. Um, we're going into production, I don't know, they'll let us know probably in a week's time that it needs to be up today, but we'll see how that goes. Um, so the reason behind that is that when you delegate your permission into that single account, you can, you've got a twofold security mechanism in place. You can firstly, if a user in your master account needs to be cut off from the system, there's one place you go and you cut them off and then you're sorted. Or let's say one of your environments is um, compromised. 
then you can just cut off the permissions from that environment uh, or to that environment on the master account as well. So it's very nice separation of concerns. And also, having a complete AWS root account per environment allows you to have them exactly the same. Um, I'll be touching on that a little bit later when we get to the Terraform stuff um, in terms of how we handle our environments. There are two ways of doing it, and I have got some strong opinions about that. Um, so, I just put this one in here quickly just to warn you about the next slide because I'm now going to start talking about config files. So, the reason why the, the subtitle for the talk is practical incremental steps is that this is the current flow which I've seen in a lot of talks. They show you their old ugly setup. <laughs> then, yes, Google agrees this is an ugly dog. Google doesn't know what a pretty dog is, funnily enough, which is, yeah. Then they wave a magic wand, and then, hey presto, here's our pretty system. It is now working. And then they tell you about the nice unicorn and how things are rolling nicely and everything is great and all the devs are happy. Um, but that's not quite how things tend up happening. Normally, what happens is it turns out being a small evolution. You make like a small thing step by step by step, and that's how you start chiseling away at your current setup to get into a space where you can actually move faster and do things without breaking. Um, so basically, in the beginning, um, we had some config files that looked a little bit like this. Most people will have some kind of database in their system. Uh, we use RDS um, because we really don't want to manage our databases ourselves, um, Postgres specifically. So there would be some kind of AWS URL you would use, and we would hard code this into a config file along with a username and a password. Um, I know Mike said that um, you should use environment variables, and we'll get to that. Um, but basically, this was just to get things going, because I mean, this is dev, this is your validating whether or not what you're building is actually working. So the big thing to understand here is that even though this isn't something you want to do in the long run, this helps you get started very quickly. The natural evolution from this is when we started going to staging, we then added a second config file and just a single um, variable added to the startup of the service to indicate which of the two config files to, reach, uh, to read when it starts up. Once again, yes, this is a security issue, but um, it's at that point the focus is more getting stuff out the door than it is to have a super polished system that nobody uses and doesn't have any features. Um, so the easiest first step to take there is to start using um, internal DNS. Um, you can call whatever um, domain you want um, with specifically, so my reference will all be mostly to AWS. Um, you can get the same things done using other services locally on your own um, metal if you want. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Google and Azure have got a similar service that you can use. So the first step for me was take all the different databases that we have and go and create internal DNS names for them that, are, that we can split out. Because currently we have um, one or two RDS instances with multiple DBs on them for all the different services. And we do want to split that out even more later uh, into individual ones. But for now, there is no benefit to splitting it out. So we are preparing for it, but we don't have to deal with it right now. Um, it's still not a good config file because as you can see, you can still see the username and password. Um, the URL is a little bit more readable, um, and if you set that to the same value in each environment, it means that DNS then needs to be updated if you want to switch your a DB to somewhere else, which is um, almost instantaneous if it's internal DNS. Um, our last step there was then to actually change it into environment variables. Um, so this is where Mike would have said that I was um, wrong, but he was at least a little bit less wrong than we were at the start. So that's all good. Um, environment variables aren't always that great. Uh, the reason is everything on that host can read them. Um, and a lot of the tutorials will show you that with AWS, you should put that information in your user data when you spin up the instance. The one issue with that is that one of the most common permissions that services require of you when you integrate with AWS is describe EC2 instance, which will describe your user data, which will expose your secrets. So while useful and people do suggest using it, it's a little bit unsafe. Um, it, because, for example, we integrate with Datadog, um, and they can read and describe the instances, which means they would be able to get to that info. So setting it with um, some mechanism on the host is a bit better. Um, quick question. Who here uses C Sharp? OK. I've also used quite a bit. Uh, who of you have heard of the uh, of parameters XML that you can use to inject? Um, hey. Brett, thank you. Um, so for those C Sharp, devs out there, this is a very nice, um, it's a XML transformation mechanism that when you build your project, instead of saying build it according to that, um, I forgot what the titles, that little drop down where you can switch between dev, prod, and it'll swap out your web config with that version of the config. Instead of doing that, you can use um, parameters XML to do a XML transform and replace at deploy time instead of at build time. 
So what you'll do is you'll compile your app with placeholders and blanks. And then when you do the actual deployment, um, MS Deploy is um, smart enough to know that use this parameters XML file that you provided and then take that inject it into your web config and that's then how you deploy it, which means you take your sensitive data much closer to your deployment system. So it's really for the Windows and C Sharp people out there, please go Google those two terms together. It will make your life a lot easier. Um, so from our perspective to get things on the server, um, on the left is where we currently are at and in the middle and right is where we will be heading soon. So we use Chef to configure our servers. Um, we actually do that in three different mechanisms. The first one is starting with the blank Ubuntu box and it will, Chef will install everything for us. Um, we found that useful for services where we're not quite sure exactly what we're doing yet but it's good enough for now once again and it works. Um, the second flavor is um, where most of the base image has got um, the installed bits there. So for example, um, it could, might come pre-installed with Java and uh, Datadog and a couple of other services and then if there's anything like service specific that we need, it gets installed. And the third flavor is um, where we pre-build the AMI with everything on it. Um, this talk is not really going to be, well, not really, it's not going to touch Docker at all. Um, we do have Docker, um, also using it in various ways. The one way we use it is we pre-build an image where we go and pull um, the container onto the node, uh, the MI, snapshot it, and that's then what we use for scaling. The reason for that is the, we, because we deal with scientific libraries like NumPy and SciPy, our containers are about two gigs big, which means if you spin it up and you try and pull it from S3, that's an eight to 15 minute window before your instance is up. Where if we do that this way, where we actually pre-build it, pre-bake it into the MI, we are able to spin up a node with between 90 and about 100, 110 seconds, which is much nicer for our scaling needs. Um, even those nodes are part of Chef. The reason for that is um, a lot of people talk about immutable infrastructure where if you want to change any one small thing even, you have to recreate the instance and just spin it out, which it sounds nice in theory and it sounds nice and clean, but in practice it takes long and it's, for example, you want to change your Datadog key because they had a breach. Um, having to re-spin your entire infrastructure just for that one change feels a little overboard for me. Um, so the way we dealt with that is um, I had to deal with it on the healthcare side and then I was helping my brother out with a project. Both si sides were using Datadog. Uh, healthcare had about, I want to say, 85 or 100 servers at that point. My brother had 10. Healthcare took five minutes to fix. My brother's servers took an hour and a half to fix. Difference being, on the healthcare side, Chef was managing the Datadog API keys. So I went in, changed them, pushed it up to the Chef server and 30 minutes later it was rolled out on all servers. I don't have to do anything and I could revoke the old keys and we were done. On the other side, I had to SSH into every single box because we hadn't set up Chef yet, change the key by hand, restart the process by hand, and then also keep a log of which servers had been done and which hadn't. Um, so that's kind of my fit at the moment is there's, there's a nice balance in the middle. You don't have to go for what the current fashion is in infrastructure always. Um, I mentioned before that we use uh, Route 53. Um, initially, we just used it for internal DNS. Uh, it's got a very high cost of 50 US cents per month per uh, domain that we, you want to use in there. So, for example, our databases and other services internally, we register against uh, healthkey.internal, which can only resolve within the VPC, not outside. But it's very useful for basic service discovery without a proper service discovery mechanism in place yet. Um, then we had a long discussion on we want to move our external DNS onto Route 53 as well. Uh, the main reason for that was if we as developers want to make a change to a URL or add a new service, we always had to mail someone who was in the US time zone, um, hope their schedule wasn't too busy to actually look at the mail, then we had to set up a meeting to discuss the changes. After that we had to get approval and you can imagine how long that takes to make changes. Um, so after a long discussion we convinced them that we'll keep the um, domains registered on an account that we don't have access to, but then we just point the name servers to our Route 53 name servers. So now, business obviously does not like rest and they do not li don't like things breaking. So they went, okay, you want to switch DNS servers? How is this going to work and can you guarantee us we won't have downtime and things won't break? So we said, sure, not a problem. Um, I found a couple of different um, RSpec scripts. Um, RSpec is Ruby's, one of Ruby's testing libraries, I believe. Um, I pretend to know Ruby but it's just from a little bit of chef playing that I know it and I got to go to Ruby Fusa because of that so I know Ruby. Um, so I built strapping a couple of different things together, just a basic test that will use dig to interrogate um, a um, public name server, for example Google's 88881 
and then also hard code in the new Amazon one. So basically, I took a dump of our current um, registrar's um, DNS config, put that in a text file, ran it through this test, and as you can see, there was one there that failed that I missed or hadn't configured correctly. So once this was all passing, it was quite nice to go to back to the business side and say, listen, look here, I can actually show you that this won't break. And we made the change, and for the first domain, there was no issue. Um, no, we didn't um, make a mistake. The second one we were planning to do on um, over a weekend so that we wouldn't have issues, and then for some reason on Thursday, that domain just disappeared. We still don't know exactly what happened. It was just none of the um, URLs would resolve on it, even though the name servers were still pointing to the old one. So we did an emergency switch, but luckily that was also not too scary because we had the test to say, listen, we, are, we have pretty much 100% confidence that this is configured correctly. So now on to starting to touch a little bit on Terraform. Um, we use that to manage our DNS infrastructure. So what you can see over there is the actual resource definition for, on the Terraform side that for defining lifegear.com. Um, everything you see that has got the dollar um, brace of R, is a, of, that's the syntax in, in Terraform for defining a variable. So you can see that the environment, the role, the system, and the AWS region are um, parameters that we pass into it. So top level one, that's just defining a zone. That says I've got lifekey.com, boom, define it. Then if I want to add an A record, it's as simple at the bottom there saying take that zone up there, which uses um, the resource referencing um, that you set to actually define which zone am I talking to, in which this case it's the resource I want is an AWS Route 53 zone resource. It's called lifeq, which you can see in the top, um, the second quoted string. And then lastly, from that, resource, I want the zone ID value, and then it injects it in here. I tell it that this is an A record, I give it a TTL, and then I give it a, in this case, um, a hard-coded IP. Um, that's nice for, this is our, I believe, our WordPress blog, just for the base site type thing. It's a static IP that will almost never change often. Question then is, what happens with um, things that do change? So we had a situation where we were preparing for, um, with a new client, and I think about a day before, someone on the business side had this idea, hey, why don't we customize this? We can make them feel special. Let's call prefix everything with customer's name, dot. And we're like, oh. Um, that changed because we also use um, Amazon's uh, certificate manager. It is effectively a free SSL cert generator. You go and click and say, add the names you want in the cert. You can add up to 30. Um, then it'll mail the DNS owner's um, email address and then you just in that mail go click I approve for all the various um, owners of the domains that they ask for and then you get your certificate issued in AWS. You can never get to the actual certificate but you can then use it. So in our case that was also a little bit of a con convincing saying listen we can't be dependent on external parties if we want to do this often which we started doing very often. I think we're up to probably like 40 or 50 certificates at the moment but because that was already in place Doing this change took us, I think, an hour to two hours. We did everything by hand the first time because there was a time constraint. So all that happened is we went and said, okay, cool, generate me a new certificate with the old name, add the new name, go put it back in, um, in the load balancer, flip it out, so now you know that your load balancer is ready to actually accept connections on both SSL um, domain name or SSL URLs that are incoming. Um, then the second part is, okay, cool, let's add the DNS entry and then points there. And then it doesn't matter which one of the two you get, that server will serve the correct certificate to it, which is quite nice. It's also nice for when you upgrade to different um, domain names. Um, main thing there is I have that bright idea that we're going to call everything environment and then the rest. So for example, testing.internalsystem.lifekey.com, which worked out well until I started thinking a bit longer term, let's say we want to use um, some kind of reverse proxy and then from there split out to all our internal services and realize that you can't put the wildcard after testing wildcard domain name. So now we have to do wildcard testing lifekey.com. Now what I did is our certs look a little bit crazy because they've got testing dot something at lifekey.com, something or testing at lifekey.com, and then other permutations of them. But that is fine because once again, we manage this complexity with Terraform. So what you'll see up, up there is, um, sorry, this is still the internal one. Uh, sorry, I'm missing a slide. No, sorry, it is this one. So for that complexity, what you'll see at the top is, um, so we called it, there's an environment name and there's a customer name. Then we want to create an actual C name to point to the load balancer. If you look at the top of that first resource, you'll see there's a count, where it actually goes and counts the DNS prefix. And then what it does is, when you set the name, you'll see there's some funky lookup and string interpolation happening. 
Basically, it just takes the combinations of the prefixes along with the actual system name and goes and creates DNS records for each of them. Um, this is a standard Terraform function in terms of the looping over things. So in that case, let's say they come around and they say, listen, we want to call the same system customer 2. We would go and create new SSL certificates, add it to the load balancer. Um, the act of adding to the load balancer is automated. The act, act of requesting is not, because you always need a human in the loop to actually confirm that this certificate should be issued. You don't, if it gets to the let's encrypt level where it's just system type things, that's a different discussion. But from AWS's perspective, it makes sense that you have to go do it via um, email to confirm. So basically, that's how we handled um, the DNS stuff. And you can even do um, if statements. So you can see the bottom resource where there's a specific um, name, because we used to have called our main system link. We've now renamed it core, which means but we still want the old DNS there, but we only want it in dev because we've already fixed staging, or it was never rolled out on staging. So what you can do here is you can make it, this is dev specific. So even though there's this little rule that normally only one person would know about, and then you'll have to wait till something breaks before someone says, oh, by the way, yeah, you have to do that. Now you could go, hey, look, that's a little dev exception. Um, then for the internal DNS, um, this is now that little dig I made at the AWS guys with regard to the auto scaling groups. Um, we've got an Elasticsearch um, cluster. Currently, we specify the number of instances we want. Um, rather than saying create me an auto scaling group uh, that we dynamically scale up and down, and that's purely so we can use the resource at the bottom, which once again counts the number of Elasticsearch instances which we can define with a variable. Um, that then will, as soon as a new node comes up, it'll go add it to the internal DNS, and then round robin DNS, and you can start hitting it again. Mm. This is good. <laughs> so, where we started. When I started um, working at, or with HealthQ, um, there were some bash scripts spinning up the environment. And that was great to start with, because I mean, there is at least something. It's not, while the very first iteration was people clicking, um, they spent the time and effort to actually write bash scripts with AWS's CLI to go spin up things. Um, I don't know if, if anyone's spent any significant time integrating with the APIs directly. It tends to get a little complex later with the number of calls and things you need to make. So I took that and I saw AWS had this product called CloudFormation. Uh, this was around 2015 in the middle. And I started playing with that. Uh, initial results were great. Create a CloudFormation formation template. It's just this one massive JSON blob. And you can upload it, and there, boom, you get some infrastructure out. And you can tokenize it a little bit. Um, it seemed to work well. And then we started hitting limitations. For example, your JSON file cannot be more than 51 kilobytes. Then you have to start splitting it up and then start referencing. Now, you can imagine what a 51K JSON file looks like. It is not fun to work with. So part of the problem there might have been, in the, it was the same when I moved over to Ansible, is I might have had too much in a single like, state that I was trying to keep. Um, but in general, the thing that I didn't like about CloudFormation um, was that you upload this massive template, it goes and it starts spinning. You just see spinning, a couple of lines popping out, and then something might break in the middle, like three, four, five minutes in, and then it starts rolling back. Sometimes it couldn't roll everything back. Um, it was just the feedback loop was too slow, and it was, I couldn't see what was happening there. Um, and I think the final straw for me there was that I had this great tool where you can say, hey, spin up an instance, with the AWS tool pointed at your environment and it'll generate your CloudFormation template for you. And I'm like, yay, nice, generate. Take the template, CloudFormation. Uh, variables not named correctly. Uh, so there was a naming convention, between, I think it was the security groups that, or something like that where the tool generating the CloudFormation template gave them names that weren't allowed by the actual CloudFormation tool or the actual systems, which was just, that's kind of why I said, okay, game over, I'm done. Um, once again, I'm bashing it a little bit, but that's just my experience. It's quite likely better, and more likely is I just didn't use it correctly. So I moved out to Ansible, a new shiny toy. Uh, apparently, Yaku says I like my shiny toys, and I keep changing them, so next shiny toy. So I spent the next six months with Ansible building out our infrastructure. Now, to put things in perspective, we've got, I think, around about 30 servers per environment. Um, our models that run stuff, they are about there were seven or eight of them at that point. We've got eight or nine internal APIs, uh, three or four RDSs, and then influx at the bottom, a couple of load balancers. So it's quite a big system. So spent a lot of time doing that. Um, and then once again, it got to a point where it was this massive system, and it ran, and it gave me fairly good feedback. Um, I got quite far with it. Um, and then the two things that really broke me there again is that, um, firstly, Ansible at that point hadn't got um, built all the um, AWS modules. 
So I had to either go and they had bugs in some of them, which is, this is standard for open source projects, especially if they're new. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just at that point I got and I started fixing things and I thought about sending upstream, but then it came, became clear that the amount of effort I would have to spend as a non-Python dev learning Python and fixing Python um, wouldn't really warrant putting that much effort into this because it'll take, pretty much become a full-time job and there were other things I had to pay attention to as well. The second thing that broke me was that it had this tendency that if you made some kind of typo somewhere, it, you end up with undefined variable. It scrolls behind this little uh, pink purpley color, but it doesn't stop. So basically, you run it, and you see the text scroll by, and you're like sitting there waiting, 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 purple, oh crap, control C, and then it's like, it just says undefined variable. Then you're like, okay, get diff quickly, what did I change now? And that ended up um, making me kind of like scared of using the tool. Um, I would make one change, save, run it, sit for five minutes, wait for it, okay, it finished, next change. And you can imagine that is not really conducive to delivering things. So then I heard about Terraform, um, use some other HashiCorp tools, and I'm like, ooh, it's even shinier. So let's use this one. And we've now been using it for, I wanna say, seven months already, and we have got no intention of moving off it. There was a little bit of hiccup, I know. Um, Ruben got burned by the latest version. Um, I also tend to upgrade on the day that the new version comes out. For some reason, that one I just didn't. Um, and you got burned, so I'm like, okay, I'll wait for this one. But um, Terraform is nice in the sense that you define your resources um, and it's a declarative language and then what it does is when you run, you can say, um, uh, what's the term? It's run, uh, it's apply and it's plan. So then what you do is you tell it, hey listen, I have to find this massive infrastructure, please go plan. And then it'll spit out what it wants to go and apply based on what it knows is going on in the state file and I'll show you some of all of this uh, versus what it can interrogate from the Amazon API. So this is kind of where that whole infrastructure as code thing comes from. Um, this is, we've um, created a module for creating a VPC. Our basic VPC has got um, uh, one subnet for public use, then the second subnet for the NAT, NAT gateways, a public routing table, three private routing tables, depending on the number of AZs you send this. But bottom line is if we need a new VPC and we've got a couple per environment, you would just take those couple of lines, you would go set those variables for that specific system and you can go run, um, plan and you can go apply and you've got your um, VPC running. So to take a look at what that looks like is this is what a snippet of our config would look like. You can see that, for example, this now, I think this is, it's point one says dev. So this is our dev variable files. There's a similar one for testing, staging, and there will be one for production as well. We, we define different IP ranges and different um, SH keys and key names and things just to keep things nice and clean. Um, one nice tip with Amazon, if you are gonna do multi VPC and um, have many systems, don't use the same CIDR blocks. The reason for that is if you have different blocks, you can actually peer VPC um, together. So even though it's a completely separated network, you can then create a link between them and start routing between them if the IPs are different. Which means in our case, we've got our master account where we have certain things running. Um, for example, our chef server is there. So the long-term plan is to have all the environment VPCs peer directly with that VPC, because then we can speak to chef directly through all the internal network. We don't have to go outside our network, so we don't pay for networking costs, and also there's no chance of anybody even seeing that, and we can block down chef so we don't um, allow access to it from external, which even though it is secure, it means that's one less thing to worry about. Um, then what it'll look like when you run this is something like this. Um, hold on. It's free. So when you run the plan command, it'll spit out something like this, which if you look at the top left, you'll see the little plus. That is, it's going to create this. And what it's gonna create is it'll show the, value the values that it knows about. So you will notice that the um, actual IP block is different because I ran this on production, seeing as it's not there yet, so it'd be a nice clean create instead of a change or me having to break something just to show this to you. So you can see that most of the values are computed because they haven't gotten, been assigned IDs yet. So when you create something like AWS, pretty much everything gets an ID. Those IDs will be computed and added. The values that you have set, you can read there. And even if you're not an infrastructure expert, you can read this and you can tell me what you think this is gonna do. This gives me a lot of confidence in terms of what I'm going to be changing to our infrastructure. So let's say you do make a change. It'll look something like this. So there you see I'm changing the auto scaling group desired capacity, I'm also sw swapping out the launch config. 
Reasons for that is that on AWS, you can't change a launch config. The reason being that, let's say you launched five instances with this launch config, you're now going to fiddle with it. Now you launch three. Now you've got five and three, but you've got no idea between these eight servers what config they use to start. So you cannot change a launch config. So you always have to cre create a new one. So in this instance, we changed the instance size, which is from a T2 medium into a T2 large. And at the same time, we bump the version number of the launch config. So it'll go create a new launch config. Um, there's a mechanism for telling it to create before it destroys the old one. So it creates a new launch config, sets the values on it, attaches the um, auto scaling group, or configs it to use that launch config, then goes and deletes the old launch config. Um, I would like to keep the old launch config, but there isn't that much value, and it seems to be a fairly hard thing to do with Terraform. So we're avoiding that little problem at the moment. Um, next, monitoring. So let's say you've got your system. You've got the infrastructure fairly automated. You've got your configuration management going. You can use things. Now it's like, is the system running or not? If you don't know if your system is running or if something's broken, you actually do have a looting system. The only problem is it's your customer, um, which is not where you want to be. Um, customer telling you that the site is down is one of the worst experiences, and that's the easiest way to erode trust between you and your customers. So what we use is we use Datadog. And we've also got um, an out stack set up on the inside. Um, Reason for Datadog, it is a paid service. And a lot of people say $15 a, n a month for a node is very expensive. But the counter argument to that is this. If you look at the math, that is not that expensive if you are a startup. You can't really find, I think, a mid-level um, like system engineer that, you can, that will be able to set up a monitoring system. And also, you, this, you haven't factored in the cost of actually the hardware of running the said monitoring system and keeping it up and making sure it actually um, reports things correctly. So we're still on Datadog, and our bill is starting to get to a point where it's worth our while to invest in it. But once again, there's no value from the business side in us changing over to a different monitoring system yet. There's a monetary value, but at the moment, that's still tolerable. So really, um, I really like Datadog. It's one of the first ones I've played with. It's simple. You can easily start setting up graphs and things. For example, this is what our dashboard looked like. Um, and so it's been anonymized a bit to protect things. Um, you can see. The three columns in the middle with the most and the, there's one little yellow at the bottom, those are consumers on our rabbit queue. So you can see on the left is the number of consumers we have, and the middle is how many messages are currently in flight. And the last one is how many error, uh, messages uh, were added to the error queue. So we can see that, or the retry queue, there's something not quite right there. So I specifically chose this one because you can easily see, hey, something did a hiccup there, and if it stays there, then you can start, um, you can act. Um, this was had a very interesting social effect at the company. We put this up on a screen above our coffee machines, and within the first day, we asked so many questions about what does this mean, what does that do, where does my stuff fit into that? There was a great talking point with all the other teams that actually write, because we have people building physical circuit boards, then the single processing drivers for those boards, then we've got the science division that actually does all the um, research on, let's say, um, we did one recently, the effect of caffeine on your blood pressure. So those science level people, then we've got the mathematicians that actually write the Python models um, for us that actually interpret the data. So you can imagine that's quite a broad scope of people. But all of a sudden, everybody came together and said, hey, look at this dashboard. Um, where's my stuff? Where does it fit in? What does this mean? And we, our initial one had some stuff in there with very useful, the tech people, and the other people were like, why would you even want to look at that? So this is the more polished product. Um, Yaku spent quite a lot of time on this, and it's actually quite nice now. So the nice thing from this is, so we measure the number of files we ingest per day. This is the weekly graph. And what made this very, very nice was, you can see there on the right, it was a Tuesday. There's suddenly a very large spike. The reason for that is we had, um, with this pilot, um, it was a corporate, and they had very strict proxy and whitelisting rules for going outside of the network. Um, and we actually set up a, a proxy on our end because we serve our files from S3, um, even the download to install the app, which means that if you want to open up your firewall just through those IPs, you can go look it up, which is nice from Amazon. It's a very nice API, JSON, that you can use and ingest. Problem is, it's 190 plus um, IP blocks. Now, you can imagine nobody's going to enter that by hand. And it also starts making your firewall slow. So they just said, OK, we're not doing this. So solution, we set up a, um, our own little squid proxy that just reverse proxies into uh, S3 from there. And the day we rolled it out, you can see immediately on the graph. And that was also like support people were going like, yeah, I can see it's working. And even though they haven't seen less people, yes, Catherine. Um, and they were very happy about that. So, so far, this has all been, you know, happy news, fun news. We're learning. We're all having fun. And then there's that day where you start realizing this. 
So AWS has got some of the smartest people on the planet, I think, with regard to their systems they're building. But even with that, things like this happen. Now, this isn't the S3 outage. Um, we were touched by that, but I'm not too worried about it. Um, this was just a little hiccup during the day. The total outage, or degradation rather, as they call it so nicely, was about 15 minutes. And we've got this in our Slack, um, in the one Slack channel for the software dev. So even though we weren't at that point affected by this, it was very nice to know. So you can actually set up Datadog to monitor all the AWS services and tell you if specific ones go down. So if you look at, if we go back to this one, top left, that 31, that was actually during this period where you can see there's one red service, so you know that there's something happening in your AWS region but 31 of the other services are still fine. So you just know that, hey, let's be aware of something, or if you start seeing a lot of red, you can react to it and start doing things. Um, and that is the end of this presentation. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, then, just before we get to the questions, uh, I mentioned DevOps Days. Uh, we are having our conference again um, in November. We've already set the dates. You can go look at devopsdays.org, and we will really like some more local speakers to actually um, present this year. Um, so please go have a look there. And then I've got some of the stuff on my blog, although there aren't that many entries. So if you want to go look at, for example, the par parameters of XML thing, um, it's on that second one. Um, and that is it. Have we got any questions? Sorry, uh, when you're working with Terraform, have uh, you solved a sharing of global state? And uh, how are you managing that at the moment? And secondly, are you also looking at the other HashiCorp products uh, like Packer and such to do your build process? And yes. So starting from the back, we actually use Packer to build those um, AMIs I spoke about that have the Docker containers pre-pulled. Uh, pre we also have, and we're very hipster, we've got Elixir API in production, uh, or pre-production. And we use that to actually pre-build the AMI that it runs on. So yes, Packer for building AMIs or even just VMware images, we actually use it to also build our test kitchen uh, images. It's very useful. Then the Terraform state file one is a bit more tricky. So I've actually created a little open source bash script framework for that. What we do is we've got the, um, in terms of to limit the blast radius, we firstly break um, apart things in the different main systems. So you'll have, let's say, our core system, the support app, a couple of other ones, they're all in individual folders, so when you make changes with Terraform, it's limited to that set of systems that you may be making a change. Inside each of those directories, we don't have the um, .terraform folder. What we do have is an underscore environment name folder, and in that, we've got a state file. That state file has, uh, is set up to use uh, S3 as a backend, specific to that environment. And we actually use the different IAM roles to make sure that uh, one environment cannot accidentally read another environment's um, S3 um, TF state file. So what happens then is because you've got the state files in there and inside those state files that get committed, the only bit they have in them is the system name and the environment name um, and then the bucket in which it's stored, which is even if you have that, if you don't have access keys, you can't do anything with it. And the rest of the state file is actually empty. It's as if you start a new uh, Terraform state. The reason for that is that when you, uh, we then take that file and copy it into the .terraform when we run it for a specific environment. So let's say I, I've got a little um, wrapper script that says plan for development. It'll go and grab the development Terraform state file, chuck it into the .terraform um, folder, then run Terraform uh, plan. What that does is Terraform sees there's a Terraform state file in the .terraform folder, go read it and see, oh, this has got a remote state file. It goes to S3, pulls it down, puts it there, then does the state compare, and actually when you do the apply, it actually writes it and then writes it back up again. Part of our wrapper for the apply part is that once the plan is complete, it deletes the plan file, and it also deletes the local state file. So yes, you can get the local state file, and there is a bit of a security issue. We're still looking at how to get around that, but we don't have to worry about dealing with that um, now. And we've, the, the nice thing about doing it this way, rather than what some other people do, which is have a folder per environment, where you copy, let's say you want to create a new server, you go create your Terraform files in dev, and then once you're happy to promote the staging, you copy and paste it into staging. Uh, folder. I don't like that idea because it opens up the door for people saying, uh, my service is special, I want it to look like this here and I want it to look like that there and that makes my life hard so I just say no. Um, because it's declarative, iterating over things is quite hard with Terraform. You've got the count, uh, but then what it spits out is um, something, something, dot one, dot two, dot three, dot four. 
Um, how do you actually get to, especially if you've got, uh, for instance, specific DNS names that you want to reference later, how do you know which name went into which count? And can you? Because that, yeah. Yes. Um, basically what you do then is you take the output, it's not pretty, but you should have a list of, for example, one of the things we do is we've got different bucket names per environment because buckets are unique to, um, I've got a unique total name. So we've got something dash dev, testing, staging, whatever. So we have those bucket names, the base bucket name defined in a list. And then what you can say is you know that I'm dealing with dev because each Terraform run that we do, there's a variable set with the environment name. So I say take that list, go use dev because it's set, look where dev is in that list position, that is the list that was actually used to create the stuff and then actually pull out the value again from that. Don't forget there's a prize for the best question, just saying. So you mentioned Datadog, have you tried out CloudWatch? Um, and what makes Datadog better for your use case? Um, basically, no, I haven't tried anything else yet. It is one of those things where I like playing with new toys, but if I play with something and it actually solves my problem, then I stop and I move on to other problems. So Datadog was uh, being used a little bit and then we started using it more and it at the moment still solves all our needs. The only aspect is as we start growing the number of servers, it becomes more expensive. So currently it serves our needs and there really is no reason to look elsewhere yet. When that need arises, we'll do it or if it becomes too expensive, we'll investigate other options. We are looking at, for example, Prometheus, um, the log collection and then putting Grafana on top of that to um, actually do it. And I think Grafana 4 recently received the alerting capabilities and Prometheus as well. So there are a lot of things you can do, but once again, they're bigger fish to fry that actually add value to the business. Uh, just, I just wanted to ask, how do you maintain your ops beard? Do you have to oil that or do you have special combs? It's just... Yes. <laughs> the beard is oiled and every now and again my wife, um, it was her idea with the space invader on the roof by the way, she says, okay sit down, your beard's looking bad, rub this in. And then I sit. I have a question. There's a lot of legacy DNS in your presentation. Um, how's IPv6? What? I can't hear you. <laughs> yes, no, IPv6 is a bit of an issue. It's, uh, there was a new feature, the uh, egress only gateways that AWS rolled out recently would reduce our cost by quite a lot because then we won't need NAT gateways anymore. But it's only IPv6 and we are not IPv6 yet. So, no. Okay. Cool. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kubis.